Divine Truth Interviews Jesus, Mary and others are interviewed by members of the media and the public. Jesus is interviewed by Mary Magdalene on the topic of Divine Truth. The interview was held on the 21st of August 2013 in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. This is Session 1, Part 2. What would you classify as personal truth? Well, um, personal truth has attributes and characteristics, just like divine truth has absolute uh, has, you know, uh, characteristics and attributes. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the attributes of personal truth are very, very different to the attributes of divine truth. So, let's say divine truth is God's truth, or absolute in nature. Personal truth often varies from day to day, <laughs> so it has this. You know, one day I feel this way and the next day I feel that way. Like yesterday I thought that you didn't love me, today I think you do. You know, personal truth varies quite markedly and, it, and often is not correct at all. It, it is just a personal opinion. Mm -hmm. Often not backed up by facts, not backed up by logic, not by, backed up by science, not backed up by mathematics, not backed up by reality. Often it's imagination uh -huh. that we determine as personal truth. So that's one characteristic of personal truth. Personal truth is very, very different from God's truth in that God's truth is absolute, is scientific, is mathematical, is backed up by facts, is reality. <laughs> sure. And obviously the difference between the two are quite large. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so when a person says, this is my truth, I, I go, yeah, you have no understanding yet of the difference between absolute truth and your truth. And when you hold on to your truth as hard as you do, you are often preventing yourself from discovering divine truth, God's truth, as a result. So then just to clarify, <coughs> would you say that personal truth is something that at the moment I emotionally accept to be truth? Yes. And it may be completely in error from God's perspective? And can, yeah. Or it may hold totally. parts of the truth from God's perspective. Yes. Or it may be right in harmony with God's truth. Yes. Right. So it's just something that I think is true right now. Exactly. It's just a personal opinion, right. basically. Right. It's a personal opinion, not necessarily backed up by facts, yeah. by logic, yeah. by scientific accuracy or mathematical accuracy, not backed up by our reality even. Yeah. It can be something that somebody even imagines yeah. to be true. It might, and oftentimes is, not backed up by personal experience. So in other words, oftentimes a person will say, oh, did you know over in Bali this particular thing happened? This is something that happened with my mother a few weeks ago. <laughs> over in Bali, this is the kind of thing that happened. I said to mum, have you ever been to Bali? She says, no. I said, so how do you know it happened? <laughs> like, all you're doing is you're believing the media, which often lies, like you know from my own experience that they've lied about everything. So, so why would you then believe the media is not lying or telling part truths about that particular thing? You've not been there. It's not been a part of your personal experience. So how would you know? That's one thing that's very, very different as well, is that divine truth can be experienced. Personal truth is often just an imaginary experience or something that's not even happened. It's just that something that's been given to you or said to you or implied to you that you then have made suppositions or assumptions about. So you're saying personal truth can actually come from fears within us. It can come Opinions from all sorts within of sources, us, yes. Fears within us um, or even a, a something that's a lie from God's perspective. Can totally. actually um, be the start of what we yes. believe is Let, the let's, truth. Let's give a few examples of that. Mm -hmm. If you look at uh, here's 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 a truth that the majority we're talking now the majority of Christians and the majority of other religious uh, forms. But let's look at the majority of Christians. There's about one and a half billion Christians on the planet. And the majority of them believe in this particular fundamental truth, right? That's not a truth at all. They believe that God is going to come and destroy the wicked. Now, that's what they hope will happen and they want to have happen. And some of them fear it happening. And some of them fear it happening. Yes. 
but it's not going to happen because it's not God's truth. Mm -hmm. It's only what they want to believe. They have, no, have, they have no evidence that it's going to happen, that they have no evidence that it's happened in the past even. Mm -hmm. There is no evidence that it happens in day-to-day -day life because just as many Christians as non-Christians die. Yes. <laughs> so they have no evidence that it happens in day-to-day -day life and yet they want it to believe that it happens. Mm -hmm. So this is, an, uh, this is an example of something that a lot of people believe is a truth and yet there is no scientific evidence to support it. There's no mathematic evidence to support it. There's no evidence in experience to support it. There's no evidence in reality to support it. There's only evidence in written matter that could have been fabricated. Mm -hmm. And even that doesn't provide very good evidence because a lot of good people died too. Yeah. So there is actually no evidence to support this fundamental belief that the 1.5 billion Christians on the planet have. There's no scientific evidence to support it. So why do they believe it? They believe it because there's emotional reasons why they wish to believe it. That's what personal truth does. What personal truth does is it has as its basis a heap of flawed emotional foundation that determines what you're willing to accept as truth and what you're will willing to reject as truth, as error. And, and in fact, a lot of the things get rejected as error that are actually true in mm -hmm. that place and a lot of things that are actually true get ignored as error in that place. And that's, that's a terrible fact about personal truth, mm. so-called personal truth. <laughs> and I, I put truth in quotation marks because it's not true. <laughs> yeah. Now, we can also see in day-to-day in -day life that we have a lot of these fundamental things going on in, in terms of day-to-day -day life. You know, the way the average parent brings up their child is fundamentally flawed because we have the evidence of that in humanity's pain. Like... Most people who become adults need some psycholog psychological help <laughs> to get over some of the fundamental flaws that have occurred in their childhood. But that parent believes that it is acting in harmony with its personal truth. Yes. So the parent is choosing to act a certain way towards its child, which later on the child grows up and feels is in error. And if the parent had any connection with divine truth, though, they'd easily see that it's an error but because they have an underlying experience of their own and underlying emotions they do not wish to feel, they bring up the child in a manner that is fund fundamentally flawed. Right? We see it in all sorts of aspects of our life. So I've brought up the religious aspect, the personal, family-based relationship aspect. We see it happening in the medical profession, the scientific profession, the political way, walks of life. The religious areas, far more of examples could be brought up. We, we have it in the um, way in which we govern our enti entire nations. We have it in environmental aspects on the earth where all of us want to believe something, which is often not true at all. Mm -hmm. That's our personal truth. Personal truth is fundamentally flawed generally. And unless it's brought into harmony with God's truth, it mm -hmm. will remain so. So why is it fundamentally flawed at this point on the planet right now? Because it makes one big fundamental assumption, and that is that you're God. <laughs> Basically, that's the assumption that a person in personal truth or thinks they have the personal truth of something makes. Basically, what they're saying is they know better than anybody else certain things. Mm -hmm. And only God knows better than anyone else. Yeah. That's the reality. So... So once we become humble and we realise only God knows better than anyone else, we then start to see that wherever we're at personally, we are in progress. We're in a process of progression. We are in training, as we could say. Once we understand that, we would not automatically assume that our personal truth is the actual fundamental absolute truth of the universe on any particular subject. We would see that we have to discover new things in every area. That's what we would see. And it would only be through the experience of millions perhaps of people, just as it is on our physical life, that we would actually come to accept certain truths. So in our physical life, for example, we've come to accept the truth that we can fly because millions of people have done it every day. 
<laughs> safely. Yeah. Right? So we've now come to accept that there are these laws of aerodynamics that govern flight. And as a result, we now live by them and we accept them. All of us, have come, all of us who have ever flown have accepted them, whether we've understood them or not, we've actually come to accept the fundamental truth that flight is possible in a controlled manner. Now, this is where we need to go in all aspects of our life. We need to see that at some point our concept of the universe is going to need to change in order to accept absolute truth about whatever God knows is the absolute truth. Mm -hmm. And God knows the absolute truth about everything, everything that we could consider and think of. God already knows the truth about. And since that is the case, our personal truth is a fundamental flaw right from the beginning because we believe we are already God on that subject and that's physically impossible. Yeah. So yeah. I, feel, I feel that we need to give up this concept of this is my truth, mm -hmm. right? This is what I believe to be true is probably a far more um, accurate statement. This is what I believe to be true at this point is even more accurate yeah. because it's actually at a point in time now yeah. that we're identifying. Tomorrow we might feel differently. Yes. Or we could say, at this point in time, this is my personal opinion mm -hmm. because that's all it is. Mm -hmm. Once we discover divine truth, though, on a certain matter, we can always prove it scientifically. We can always prove it accurately we can always support it with real evidence and experience. And so there are certain things in you and I life, for example, that we can state these are definitely fundamental, absolute truths about God and God's universe because we've experienced them. But when someone asks me a question about the future, I haven't experienced it yet. It's impossible for me to reply with any accuracy about the future. I might have feelings about the future. I might have opinions about the future, which if they're asking, I'm willing to share. But that doesn't mean they're God's truths because I have not experienced them yet. Yeah. It's, it, it's fundamentally flawed to assume that I can make a prophecy about the future and be accurate. To do that, I'd have to be God, mm -hmm. and I'm certainly not God. Mm -hmm. And so this is an indication too of the problem with personal truth, personal opinion. It needs to be changed. And so we need to not hold on to it so strongly. So every time we have these personal opinions, we need to understand, this is just my personal opinion. If you can show me something different, I'd be happy to, <laughs> I'd be happy to listen to what you've got to say. Yeah. Yeah, great. Yeah. Okay, so then just to summarise everything that you said about personal truth then, mm -hmm. often it's an error from God's perspective. Yep. Um, and usually it's based on fear. If we don't have God's perspective, then we're usually in a state of fear. Well, fear is an automatic result of not knowing truth. It's like, it's like how do you feel when you're in a dark room in comparison in a light room? If, if somebody told you there was in this dark room that you're in, there's all these possible things that could go wrong. Like this is the world we live in, actually. The world we live in, possibly, there's, a, there's huge amounts of things that could go wrong. And if we're in the dark about everything... They probably will. <laughs> it's like walking down a road in the dark with no torch and it's no moon, no light, no anything. You know, you're going to be doing this, aren't you, as you're walking along, feeling for things. If you're walking along when it's bright sunlight, you don't need to do that. So you're automatically in more fear when you're in darkness. Yes, yeah, for sure. Okay, so error from God's perspective based in fear. Mm -hmm. um, and it usually begins because of something that we want to believe in. Mm. So we hold, this is our investment in well, holding more, on to it. It's more, emo, it's more about emotions for most of us. It's, we want to believe in certain things because we emotionally can't cope with an alternative. So, you know, and this is why some people believe in God, in fact. Some people believe in God because emotionally they can't cope with the alternative. That's not why I believe in God. No. But that's why some people believe in God. Some people don't believe in God because emotionally they can't cope with the alternative yes. as well. Yeah. Some people, you know, believe in all sorts of things. They believe that their wife loves them because they can't emotionally cope with the alternative. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And so a lot of the times we construct belief systems based around what we can cope with emotionally. 
Or what we think we can cope with emotionally. Exactly. It's not even what we can cope with emotionally. It's what we believe we can cope with emotionally, which is often also flawed. Yeah. Because <laughs> God created us to cope with far more emotionally than the average person copes with. So, so the, the sad thing is that almost all of our belief systems that are personal truths are about what we can cope with emotionally or what we hope emotionally. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's got nothing to do with reality or logic. <laughs> yeah. So can we talk then about <laughs> this idea that personal truth has an emotional signature? Mm. Because that's really what you're starting to talk about now. Mm. Um, what does that mean that it has an emotional signature? That it's something that it's painful to release if it's in error? Well, it it's might not be painful. There might be pleasure associated with it as well or okay. potential pleasure. If I believe a certain thing, I feel good. If I don't believe it, I feel bad, that kind of thinking. Uh-huh. Now, I suggest that these, these are usually the underlying reasons why we have any faith in personal truth. It's because what we do is we say, I can cope emotionally with these kind of beliefs. I can't cope emotionally with these kind of beliefs. So I'm going to make out those beliefs are false yep. and make out those beliefs that I can cope with emotionally are true. Yeah. Right? So, so, for example, many Christians cannot cope emotionally with the belief that God will not come and destroy the wicked. Emotionally, they can't handle that concept even. They can't mm. handle the concept that God is going to allow wickedness for as long as it takes for mankind to realise that they can change. And most people who are Christian cannot cope with the concept that God will allow it. Mm-hmm. God is allowing it. We have proof. Very proof. Every day we have proof that God's allowing wickedness. Every moment we have proof. It's a fundamental proof. Opposite to many of the other beliefs, it's a fundamental thing we can actually prove through personal experience that God does allow wickedness. Mm -hmm. And yet, the average Christian cannot cope with that fundamental proof. And so they hope differently. They create a belief that God is going to destroy the wicked and then they hope in that. Right? And they even sometimes revert to being God's tool of getting rid of the wicked. Yeah. In other words... Not God's real tool. Yeah. Yeah, not God's real tool, <laughs> but they believe themselves to be God's messenger of truth by destroying somebody who they believe is wicked. Yeah. So there are many people historically who are Christian who have gone to war and murdered many thousands of people just because of what they believed was the truth because they couldn't cope with the fact that that wasn't true. And this is where I feel there is a huge emotional investment. This is the emotional signature, if you like, that is within people. There's huge emotional investments in believing certain things to be true that are not. My own mother has the feeling, has the personal truth that you're a really bad guy because she can't face the reality that she's behaved badly and I've made a choice about that. Exactly. (laughs) So she's more confronted with that idea than just believing that you're a bad guy. Yeah, yeah, and people do this all the time. People do this all the time. It is a fundamental problem with humanity at the moment in terms of our lack of logic. What we are constantly doing is we are throwing out what is often facing us right in the face, right? It's right there. We can see it as clear as day, but we throw it out because we can't emotionally cope with it. And so we don't believe it. we tell ourselves we can't emotionally cope with it because God has a truth that we can. Yeah, the truth is that God created us to emotionally cope with everything, Mm. but we don't believe that, of course. We believe that the pain involved with coping with it is going to be too great for our ability to feel it. And so we choose to not feel it and instead create an alter reality. Mm. We create a life based on imagination. We imagine something to be true that's not. Mm -hmm. And and this happens individually. It happens in relationships. It happens in society. It happens in nations, you know, and it happens in the world constantly. The wars of this world, particularly the wars we've observed in the last hundred years, have many times been caused by the imagination of people who don't want to face a different reality. Yeah. And it's very interesting how these things have occurred. And, you know, people who got into power, such as Hitler and Stalin and these kind of people, who eventually killed millions and millions of people through their own actions, many of them got into power because of the fears of people and what they could emotionally face. Both in, in Hitler's case in Germany and in England, you know, 
what they could emotionally face allowed a whole set of circumstances to occur that eventually resulted in a war mm -hmm. because they couldn't emotionally face certain things. The pain of the previous war, for example, for the German people. The, 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 the concept of, you know, if you take, you know, for the English people, the concept if you take away people's rights from them, sooner or later they rebel. And they, you know, they do all sorts of things when they rebel in harmony with their emotions, not in harmony with what's right. Yeah. And so we see that most of humanity's problems have actually been caused by, not by knowing the truth, but rather by holding on to the emotional signatures of what we believe truth to be, that it's actually error. So holding on to personal truth that's in disharmony with love has exactly. actually created all of the pain and suffering. Exactly. Yeah. If all of us individually decided to bring our lives into harmony with absolute truth, there would be no war. There would be no pain and suffering. That's even if we decide to not bring our lives into harmony with love. Mm -hmm. Just truth. Mm -hmm. There would be no war. Because we'd understand logically the truth that if I hurt you, then somebody who was hurt by me hurting you is probably going to want to hurt me. Yeah. That's logical. I don't even need to understand love to understand that. Yeah. Right? And yet we don't face that. Because we're so emotional, we just want to, we want to uh, exercise, our, exorcise our pain by harming someone that you've, you know, that, that's attached to your uh, life because you have harmed me. Mm. Like, so what drove us? Not logic. What's driven us is our own emotional signature of pain and suffering that we're avoiding and therefore our personal truth drove us. Now, I wouldn't call that God's truth because if, if we were in harmony with God's truth, we'd see the absolute truth that if I harm your family or you, someone in your family probably is going to feel at least like harming me mm. or someone in my family. Surely that's going to happen. Now, if we do that on a national basis, if, you're, you, know, if you happen to be Iraq and I happen to be USA, <laughs> you know, yeah. if I decide to harm you, Iraq, then someone in Iraq is going to want to finish up harming me, USA. <laughs> yeah. It makes total logical sense, and yet very few people understand it from a logical perspective or truth-based perspective, let alone an emotional one. And so this is where I see that if we understood truth better, even if we hadn't come to love yet, we, this world that we lived in would be completely different. Yeah. 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 Okay, great. And can I also say that the average person who believes in this whole concept of personal truth is fully willing to justify their own poor behaviour towards others because they don't see it from God's truth's perspective. Mm. So I, I see this whole concept of personal truth as a very damaging concept on the planet in the sense that it causes huge amounts of pain and suffering because each person is in a different set of personal truths which are not truths at all, but rather just opinions based upon their own emotional suffering. Yeah, very true. Yeah. <laughs> How does personal truth differ from God's truth? Well, obviously, just like personal truth has characteristics and attributes, so too does God's truth have characteristics and attributes. So what we can do is we can go through and discuss the attributes of personal truth or what seemingly are the attributes of personal truth and contrast them with some of these attributes and characteristics of God's truth. So I thought maybe uh, I've listed there for you some attributes of God's truth. So maybe if you could list the attributes of God's truth and then we can have a discussion about what personal truth looks like in comparison to that oftentimes. Great. Yeah. Okay. So one of the aspects of God's truth is that it's God's knowledge and it's absolute fact. Yes, as we've already mentioned. Personal truth is my personal knowledge, and therefore not absolute fact. It's just my personal opinion. <laughs> okay, God's truth is God's experience and the sum total of all experiences of all of God's creatures. Yes, whereas my personal truth is my own experience and nobody else's, <laughs> generally. I have the ability, of course, to examining other people's experiences and learning from those, but most people don't do that very well. Most people look at everybody else's experience and go, that's them. If I do the same thing, it will be different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it turns out the same and, uh, you know, we often do that. So we're often ignorant of 
the fact that uh, of even examining other people's personal experiences. Yeah. Great. Mm. Okay, God's truth is what act, what universally actually is. Yes, uh, my truth is what only is for me, <laughs> and not has it doesn't have any uh, impact upon what universally is. So, do you mean by that it's what I want to believe? Yes, it's what I want to believe, or what's happened to me, right. not what actually is. See, I, often what I what I interpret happened for me, is very different from what God's viewpoint is of what actually happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, God's truth expands personal life. Mm -hmm. Personal truth usually contracts it. Usually what happens is that once we start to believe certain things ourselves, our life becomes smaller because we have all these fears that we engage and it's sort of like a prison that we, of our own making that we create. Whereas God's truth, as you pointed out, expands in its nature. It causes us to be free of the bars. Mm -hmm. You know, we have freedom instead. Yeah. And that's probably the next one we could talk yeah. about, that God's truth results in freedom. Yes, whereas personal truth results in slavery, <laughs> literally, oftentimes. But also figurative from an emotional perspective, we're often enslaved to our concepts and ideas and beliefs that limit and severely limit our life and the lives of people around us. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So if you look at personal truth regarding religion, it has resulted in religious concepts that, that have been enslaved humanity for centuries and sometimes millennia. And sometimes we haven't gotten out of it without having a revolution. <laughs> where Scientific truth has been rejected over and over again by religion. So, so this is an example of how personal truth has enslaved humanity, right down to large groups of people being enslaved. Mm. Mm. So God's truth is only pleasurable and is always in harmony with universal truth. Yes. So, so our personal truth, often painful. <laughs> mm -hmm. we, once we come to see what's gone on with ourselves, what we believed to be true in the past, and then it's exposed, God's truth exposes something, we then feel the pain of it then. We also don't understand that, but, but a lot of our pain that we have right now is because we are holding on to our personal truth mm -hmm. rather than God's. So we don't understand that even our experience right now is painful because of our holding on to personal opinions that are not true. Mm. Mm. And I suppose all the way through this, you're speaking about personal truth when it's out of alignment with God's truth. Yes. Yeah. Obviously, a person can bring their personal truth into harmony with God's truth, but I wouldn't call that personal truth anymore. Yeah. That's just me living in harmony with God's truth, what I now know to be God's truth. And I can't call it my truth because God created it. <laughs> it's God's truth. Yeah. So I don't see there... Uh, every form of personal truth I see as an error because once we bring ourselves into harmony with God's truth, we've now brought ourselves into God's truth, not into personal truth. Yeah. So we are personally now living God's truth, yeah. if you like, yeah. which means we're personally living in God's reality. We're actually now living in the reality of the universe rather than the imaginary universe we created through our personal opinion. Yeah. <laughs> Which is an amazing thing to consider, isn't it? To exactly. Live, to live in the real world. What does it mean to live in the real yeah, world? Exactly. Oh, like, yes. like people think this is the real world. <laughs> this isn't the real world. This is the world of our, the, that is the figment of our imagination that we've created as a personal reality, but it's not God's reality. God's reality is that if we lived in harmony with all of God's truth, we'd have a very different world, you know, mm -hmm. a very different mm -hmm. life and a very different being, a very different personal feelings. A very different joy yeah. that we currently have, collectively and individually. Mm. Okay, so moving on. Yep. God's truth, with God's truth, there is always more to learn. Yes. So because God's infinite in nature, God's universe is infinite in nature, ever-expanding, and or, when I say that, I mean the multidimensional universes, there are more and more of them being created, so therefore the universe is ever-expanding. As a result of that, there's more to learn, there's more truth to know. As a result of that, it's going to be limitless. Human truth is completely the opposite. That, you know, we want to believe that all of the truths about God are contained in the Bible. For the average Christian wants to believe that. The average Muslim, of course, wants to believe they're contained within the 
Quran. Uh, yeah, Quran, you know, and, and the average other person wants to believe all sorts of things. You know, the average atheist wants to believe that it's in creation. But the reality is that these personal truths are all in error, in fact. So personal truth leads us to feel that there's no more to learn. Exactly. It causes us to believe that we have nothing more to know on a certain subject. I once read a scientific journal a few years ago which said this scientist postulated this idea or concept that he believed that mankind had discovered all of the scientific facts or the majority of the scientific facts that we were ever going to discover. And I'm going... What? <laughs> How could you believe such a thing? We've barely scraped the surface of what we can discover and yet somebody wants to believe we've discovered everything. This is how limiting personal truth is. Yeah. This belief that we already know and it's really arrogance. You know, it's really an emotion of arrogance. Mm. Yeah. Mm. All right. With God's truth, there is no compromise ever. Exactly. <laughs> personal truth compromises all the time. It's like... Depending on the situation, you know, if, like, if, if I'm talking to my wife, I'm in a different situation than if I'm talking to my mates down the pub. And that's a different situation than I'm talking to my children. So, so like, this is three conversations that I might have in the same day about the same thing. My child comes up and says, Daddy, are you going to leave Mummy? No, 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 son, I'm not going to leave Mummy. No, we're going to stay together and you're going to have a happy life, you know. Next conversation with his wife. I'm going to leave you. Every, <laughs> yeah. you know, I'm going to leave you. I'm going to. So now he's compromised, right? What he released. He goes down to mates and he says, "Oh, my wife, she's terrible." <laughs> like, uh, there's all sorts of things that happen in the course of a day where somebody just compromises the truth. Mm -hmm. They don't say the same thing to their child, the same thing to their wife, the same thing to their mates, the same thing at work, the same thing at school, the same thing, you know, in, in their social life, the same thing like to their family, the same thing to their friends, <laughs> mm -hmm. because they compromise on every issue. Now, why do they compromise on every issue? Because there's an emotional reason why in every case. There's an emotional fear present in every case. Mm -hmm. God's truth doesn't do that. Yeah. God's truth doesn't compromise with anybody, with anything, <laughs> ever. Yeah. Eternally. <laughs> uh, God's truth always acts in harmony with God's love. Yes, and this is something I feel most people don't understand too, too is that truth and love are like brothers. You know, yeah. they're, they're hand in hand. And without truth, love can't exist. And without love, truth really can't exist either. And so um, from God's... The, the beauty of, of universal truth is that it is always in harmony with God's definition of love as well. It's always based on love. Now, if you look at uh, human condition, we can often yell and sc scream and pull somebody down telling them the truth. Now, God doesn't do that. Mm. God is not trying to destroy us while God's telling us the truth. God's trying to expose things to us to help us. There's a different, whole different attitude from God than there is from humanity with regard to truth. So often people's personal truth is wanting to tear down, destroy, rebel, and all of those kind of things, which are all anti-love mm. and so they're very very different quality to them than what God's truth has mm. okay God's truth seeks full resolution yes this is something about God that most people and God's universe that most people don't understand and that God wants to share the truth to us to the complete degree in other words God wants us to discover everything there is to know and God knows that God's created an infinite universe, of course, so God knows that we won't fully discover everything, but God wants us to. There's a different attitude. There's a door open. There's a door open constantly to discover yeah. more. Yeah. With people on earth, it's very, very different. With people with their personal truth, they often very closed about what they want you to discover. So they'll tell you one thing, won't tell you another. They'll, they'll, op they'll openly disclose some things when they know it's in their best interest, but if it's in somebody else's interest and not their own, they won't tell you. Mm -hmm. So this is the compromise that people make frequently. They don't want to share everything. Mm -hmm. They only want to share what's in their own interest. Right. 
And I suppose some people um, fear conflict, don't they? So they feel that um, they that they are going to um, create conflict by sharing more. So they seek peace rather than yes. than resolving things. Really. Exactly. So so God's truth is such that, like in the case of a husband and wife, for example, God's truth is God wants the husband and wife to resolve all of their problems and get to a point where their love their love binds them without any problems, without any pain and suffering. Humanity, in the same situation, often goes, okay, I'll tolerate a certain amount of pain and suffering because I don't really want to take this to full resolution. Mm-hmm. Right? This is a problem with us on earth. We, our, our personal truth dictates that there's cert- we, we realise that if we take it to full resolution, that might mean leaving. Yeah. Or we take it the full resolution and that mean might, might mean I have to change on something I don't want to change on. So, so what do I decide to do? I decide to not take it to full resolution. And God's truth never does that. Yeah. God's truth is always wanting to go to full resolution of a problem. It's such a loving provision, isn't it? Of course, yeah. 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 Okay, God's truth never controls or forces others. Yes. So the beauty of God's truth is it has this characteristic that it's never going to force you to come to that truth. It's waiting for you to develop a desire to discover it. It's not going to, through any form of punishment, through any form of destruction or control, through any form of manipulation, try to get you to have that opinion. Mm -hmm. Now, if you contrast that with the average religion on the planet, you can see there's a huge difference between what God's truth does and what their truth does. From a humanities perspective, from a personal truth perspective, most of the time a person who has a certain belief or a certain opinion wants to force that opinion on another. Mm -hmm. They want to make the other person have the same opinion. They'll even manipulate the other person into the same opinion. They'll even falsify information in order that the other person has the same opinion, not realising that it's not a real opinion. Yeah. And, and they'll do all sorts of things in order to get somebody else to believe the same thing. Historically, religions have gone on crusades to force whole populations to believe the same thing. Yeah. That's how strongly invested we are emotionally in walking away from God's truth. Now, God's, God has this beautiful feeling towards all of humanity, this gift of free will, which, and this gift says, I am not going to force you to recognise my truth. So God's really, who, God, who knows all truth, doesn't force any of us to know that truth. Now, if we were copying that, we would never have a war about truth. We would never have a war about personal opinion. We'd never have a war about anything, probably, if we just copied that one thing, right? Because we wouldn't be trying to force another person to do anything. Yeah. Uh, whereas, and that's what God's truth does. It doesn't force another person to do anything. Mm. Mm. Even our interpersonal <coughs> discussions would have a lot less emotional charge to them, wouldn't they? Of course. Yeah. yeah. We wouldn't be arguing and fighting and bickering and... Because we do realise that every single opinion that I hold right now, unless it's been a full personal experience, I know for certain that it can't be certain. <laughs> <laughs> That's the one thing I know for certain, yeah. that it's not certain. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that it's not, it's not yet val- val- validated by the experience of knowing everything about my personal experience. Yeah. In other words, it's not yet validated by knowing God's truth about yeah. my experience. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, God's truth can never be modified, mm-hmm. even if no one accepts it. <laughs> yes, this is a beautiful thing about God's truth too, is that there, there are things right now that not a single person in the universe in which God's created knows. But that doesn't change the fact that those things are true. Just because one person doesn't know it doesn't mean that it's not true. And just because a million people think they know something, it doesn't mean it isn't true. It doesn't mean it's it false. Is. Yep. Okay. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's like this is the beautiful thing about God's truth. Because it's so fixed and immovable, it doesn't matter how many people believe it to be wrong, it's still going to be right. And it doesn't matter how many people believe it's right, it's still going to be right. Yeah. It doesn't matter if nobody believes it's right, it's still going to be right. 
because that's the nature of it. Mm -hmm. The nature of it is that it exists as truth, whether we know it as, not, as truth or not. Humanity is going to discover things in the future, even in the near future, that they never knew before. Never. And they'll go, oh, isn't this amazing? It's a miracle, <laughs> or whatever it is. It won't be any of those things. It will be just another one of God's truths mm. that they didn't know beforehand. So if we contrast that with personal truth, mm. how does that differ? Well, with personal truth, what we often see occurring is that people um, are, well, if you, look at, if you look at the situation with most, most people, they have this underlying belief that it's, o it's okay to have all of these different opinions and that, and that if, if more than one person believes it, then it's highly likely it's true. And if nobody believes it yet, then it's highly likely it's false. Mm -hmm. So in other words, it's very much governed by whether other people agree. And all that is is fear of disagreement, <laughs> fear of disapproval that causes us to have that opinion. And, but on this planet, it's very, very popular. You, you, know, you see it happening all around the world at different times. Whole nations act upon what is error because a whole lot of them collectively believe that it's true, not because if they've personally analysed it and know that it's true, but because everybody else does. Mm. They do it because everybody else agrees. And a lot of times people go along with things that everybody else agrees to, but it, that if they sat down and thought about it, they wouldn't personally agree. And the only reason why they're going along with it is because they're willing to compromise God's truth because they're afraid. Mm. So it's very frequent that that occurs. So personal truth's often modified to make it more acceptable to others. Usually modified. Yeah. So I see this happening a lot in discussions with people, you know, like the power of God's truth is that it's not modified. So you say it as it is. This is how it is. It, you can't modify it because it's how it is. But people want to embellish it somehow. They, they think that by embellishing God's truth, you're somehow going to make it more palatable or, or more able to be you know, heard by the listener. That's not true. It makes it less able to be heard by the listener. Mm. It mm -hmm. makes it less powerful. Every time you modify God's truth and try to turn it into something that it's not, you're making it harder for the person because it's like getting the torch and turning it off. <laughs> that's yeah. the problem with it. Yeah. Remember, if you think of the torch as that's God's truth and, you know, turning it off is what we do. With, with truth. personal truth, yeah. yeah. Okay, God's truth acts courageously. Yes, yeah, so, so God's truth always stands by itself. It doesn't compromise with regard to itself. If we look at personal truth, it often compromises. It often is, has cowardice associated with it. In other words, we believe something to be true, but when there's a person wanting to kill us because of it, we go, no, it's not true anymore. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. We, we're more harmonious with fear in of that course. case. Yeah. And it's not even that severe most of the time. Most of the time it's if somebody doesn't like me because of it, I'll change my mind. Yes. You know, it's, yeah, you don't even have to be threatened with death or anything. It's a lot of times just, you don't like me, I'll change my mind. <laughs> you know, that's the way it is for the majority of people on the planet when it comes to their personal truth. That they'll change their mind at the drop of a hat given how much pressure they're under. Yeah. 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 We've had that happen a lot, eh, where people have said to us, oh, we support what you're doing and everything. And then the instant we come under attack by the media or something else, they no longer support what we're doing. You know what I mean? Yeah. And nothing's changed from our perspective. No. It's just that they, they compromise, they, they have cowardice when it comes to truth. God's truth is not like that. Once God's truth is in your soul, you do not compromise like that. Mm. There, there's, no, there's always courage and, and it's fixed and immovable. Mm. You, you can't compromise on it because you know it's true for yeah. certain. Yeah. Yeah. The reason why we compromise on personal stuff is because we don't know for certain that it's true. <laughs> That's the problem. Or we are governed by a lot of very fear-based emotions. Yeah. So even when we know it for certain is true, we're willing to compromise that because we're worried about what other people will do to us. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. God's love feels only love for people who do not agree. Sorry, say so, that again. Sorry. God's truth sorry. feels only love yes. 
for people who do not agree with God's truth. Yes, so, so God's truth is, the, the truth is that God's love is for all people. Therefore, it's even for people who don't believe in God, for people who don't believe in God's truth, God still loves. Mm -hmm. Humans' truth is very different to that. Most people only love the people who agree with them. Yeah. You know, you look at families. This even happens in families. So the family will only love you while you agree with the family-based opinion. As soon as you disagree with the family-based opinion, they don't love you anymore. <laughs> you know, they act like they don't love you. They'll even hurt you. They'll even attack you because you don't do it. You know, you don't fit the mould. You see all these type of honour killings are like that. You know, that's an, that's an extreme example of how a family all of a sudden is willing to compromise love for the sake of a belief. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is untrue. Mm. Right? God's love loves in all situations. Whether the person believes or not, whether the person understands or not, whether the person is angry, bitter, twisted, murderous, rapist, whatever, God's love loves in all situations. One, but personal truth, that's what God's truth does. Personal mm -hmm. truth doesn't do that generally. Mm -hmm. Personal mm -hmm. truth compromises in almost every situation for all different reasons. Mm. Mm. Okay, this, one's, this next one's interesting. God's truth rejoices in positive change. Yes. So what, the way God's constructed the universe is very interesting and one of, the, one of the attributes of God's truth is whenever we shift and we absorb more of divine truth, we absorb more of God's truth, that causes a change within the individual. And so God's universe is constructed to change. Everything in the universe is changing at all times. Everything in the universe from a multi-dimensional space is changing all the time. There's consistent creations of new dimensional existences all the time. God's truth it promotes change, positive change, mm -hmm. constructive change. Personal truth often causes a person to remain fixed and immo immovable with regard to change. They don't want to change. They want to sit in whatever it is they're sitting in <laughs> for the rest of their existence. They don't want to move or yeah. change their mind even. Yeah. You, see, you see people not even changing their mind, but you, don't see, you often see people not changing their lives. Their lives aren't growing. You know, on this earth we have this statement, you know, I'm too old to change. No, you're not ever too old to change. In fact, the older you get, the more you need to change. In fact. <laughs> if you're stuck in personal yeah, truth. Particularly if yeah. you're stuck in personal truth. And the, 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 this is a quality of personal truth, which is this fixed, well, I'm not going to change type attitude, whereas God's truth always has this flexibility to it in that I'm going to change to receive more truth. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to change to receive error. I'm going to change to receive more truth. And that change, because I'm receiving more truth, is always going to be positive mm. in its nature. Yeah. Mm. Okay. God's truth always acts in harmony with love. I think we've said that one. Mm -hmm. well, we, we talked about God's love, perhaps. Yes. Yeah. So God's truth always acts in harmony with love. Yeah. Is, is, is this, if we contrast that with human truth, human truth often doesn't act in harmony with love at all. <laughs> well, often doesn't act at all. Doesn't act at all sometimes, yeah, you know. Yeah. Like so, so we see often people just stay in complete stagnation, not acting at all. But if they do act, quite often they act completely out of harmony with love because they believe they're right. Mm -hmm. And when they believe they're right, when they're actually wrong, they're going to do an unloving thing. Yeah. And when they do the unloving thing, there's going to be pain and suffering that results. Yeah. Right? So this is the quality of personal truth is that we're often in this place where we're acting out of harmony with love. So you, and this is where I feel there's a huge problem from religious perspective, political perspective and other perspectives on the planet is we're constantly acting out of harmony with what is obviously love yeah. because we want to believe certain things and hold on to those beliefs. Yeah, mm. yeah. All right. God's truth is automatic. What does that mean? Well, because it exists as reality, it is automatic in the sense that it happens all the time. It's on autopilot all the time. This is the beauty of the laws of the universe. It's 
they are all acting all the time. Whether we know them or not, it's immaterial. It's automatic. Yeah. The whole system is automatic. When we look at the personal thing, we've got to do something generally, take an action or whatever. The beauty of God's truth is it's automatically in process. Mm -hmm. and, and personal truth is not always automatically in process. Also, God's truth, once it's inside of us, it automatically motivates us down a certain course of action that we can't avoid because it's truth and we know it to be. Yeah. So we don't avoid it. Yeah. When we're in personal truth, it's not automatic to do good things. It's not automatic to grow. It's not automatic to change. When we're in personal truth, we often want to do the opposite of that. We often don't want to grow. We often don't want to be loving. We often don't want to change. Uh, and so when we haven't received God's truth into our souls, we're still in personal truth. And yeah. so even if we intellectually understand what might be loving, we have to practice that really hard. We have to practice it. We have to force ourselves to yeah. do it. It's yeah. not automatic. Yeah. Whereas if divine truth is actually in our soul, it's automatic. Yeah. We do it automatically. We yeah. don't do it because we have to try. We're automatically lo loving. So, so rather than me having to think about how am I going to love Mary today, <laughs> once I, I've got God's truth in my soul about as many subjects about love as I can get in my soul, I will automatically be doing it. I won't even have to think about it. It would just be an automatic... I'm, I'm doing things automatically that demonstrate to you that I love you without having to think about them. That's the beauty of God's truth. Yeah. With personal truth, we go, ah... Oh, I know I should be truthful today. I know I should do this today. I know if I loved Mary, what well, I should do this, but I don't really feel like doing it. <laughs> That's how we feel when, sorry, when we're in personal truth. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Um, last one. God's truth is without judgment and is compassionate. Yes. So if you think of God's truth as just the reality of existence, it doesn't have judgment either way. It doesn't say that's really, really bad. It doesn't say that's really, really good. It just is what it is. That's God's truth. And because love is involved with it, it understands when somebody is out of harmony with it. It understands the truth of why they're out of harmony, but it still doesn't bend. Mm -hmm. It still is what it is. Mm -hmm. It doesn't judge the person out of harmony. Personal truth is usually the opposite of that. Personal truth, we usually go, you know, it is in judgment, usually we go, that person's terrible, they shouldn't have done that, you know. That. And this is often why people can't experience emotions that cause them to stay in personal truth because they're so judged often, they feel so judged. But also they don't have a personal, person in this personal truth often isn't very compassionate, either with themselves or with other people. In other words, what they're trying to do frequently is punish a person or punish themselves for actions that are taken out of harmony with love. Now, if they were in harmony with God's truth, they wouldn't do that because God's truth doesn't do that. Mm. God's truth is what it is. It knows what it is. It is what it is. It doesn't judge a person either way. It just is what it is. If we bring ourselves into harmony with it, we will have happy life. If we don't live in harmony with it, we're going to have pain and suffering. That is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the beauty of it is, that, is that it hasn't got the judgmental factors that we have. And I feel one of the main reasons why people on earth don't want to hear truth is because they're so afraid of being judged yeah. about not living in it yeah. or about you know, their own condition in comparison to it. And, uh, and that's a sad thing. That causes many people to resist divine truth as a result. Mm. 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 So if you look at all of those already, we've had a brief discussion, really. It's been yeah. a brief discussion. I know it might have lasted <laughs> 20 minutes or 30 minutes or so. But it's really a brief discussion about the comparisons between God's truth and personal truth. So what we probably want to do is, is look more deeply at these issues, yeah. which we will do in individual discussions, yeah. 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 in individual questions. Yeah, I feel that would be really beneficial. And to talk a lot more about what it means to actually receive God's truth and live God's truth. Yeah. 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 Why is humanity resistive to divine truth? Well, the primary reasons for resistance involve around a number of factors. Um, I would say the very first factor is a resistance to pain and suffering. 
So you could say that people have like a pain threshold, um, a scale, if you like, of that they weigh the balance in. Okay. Like a, sc a scale, a pain scale. Uh huh. They have a pain, so I'd call it the pain pleasure scale, if okay. you like. They also have a, a other some other scales as well, uh -huh. um, like for instance a fear truth scale. Uh -huh. right. They also have a desire apathy scale yeah. as well, and I feel it's primarily these three scales that people have internally going on inside of them that prevent them from receiving divine truth. So can you explain to me what you mean by a scale? Well, a scale is like uh, an internal scale from an emotional perspective now we're talking. Basically what we're saying is we have a pain or pleasure scale. In other words, when the pain gets too intense, we want to shut it down. Mm -hmm. We don't want to experience it. We like experiencing pleasure. So we prefer pleasure over pain. So mm -hmm. even though we have pain in us, we prefer to feel the pleasure instead. Yes. Even if the pain resides within us still, we still want the pleasure. And, mm -hmm. we, and in fact, we become addicted to getting ple uh, pleasures, so-called pleasures, met. Oftentimes in avoidance of the pain. Yeah. And then when the pleasure gets too high, we usually want to shut that down as well, ironically. Yeah. So that's the sad part of our existence. We, we are trying to maintain an emotional equilibrium that's based upon the pain and suffering that we might feel at any point in time or the intensity of the pleasure that we might feel at any point in time. Mm -hmm. And so our decisions are not based upon logic or truth anymore. They're only based upon what can I avoid, painful-wise, and what can I have, pleasure-wise. Now, this becomes very destructive when we're doing both of these things at the same time. Mm -hmm. So that's what I would call the plain pleasure scale. And so we're <coughs> resistive to divine truth because we don't want our pain to get well, higher divine than divine truth our... will expose our error and therefore our pain. Mm -hmm. So we don't want our pain to get as high as being completely exposed. It's almost like we're happy to walk around in a dark room hitting things all the time just so no longer tells us that we're stupid doing it. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yes. In other words, no one gives us a torch and says, why are you walking around in a dark room barging into things all the time? You must have this torch so you can see where you're going. Yeah. <laughs> and then you'd feel really stupid, right? <laughs> that that torch was available to you and you could have had it and you're still bumping into things. And this is where we don't like to see even our pain exposed for even points of humiliation that we might feel. They're personal feelings. Yes. But, but, but we want to avoid the feeling. And so what we do is we suppress it. We'd rather remain in darkness to our pain. And we avoid truth because it will expose that. Yeah, truth will okay. expose it. Truth is like a flashlight showing us the areas of pain and what the causes of those pains are. And we often wish to turn that off because we want to manage our pain. We don't want to experience our pain. And presumably from what we've discussed about divine truth in other questions, it can also bring us a great deal of pleasure. And if we fear overwhelming pleasure, then w that would be another investment. Not only in that, but we also have addictive links to pleasure, usually, in avoidance of pain. We're yeah. trying to use pleasure to avoid pain. Yes. So that means often the things that we think are pleasurable are not that pleasurable, unfortunately, or particularly not pleasurable to others. And so what we do, though, is we engage an addiction-based life. Now, the truth will also expose all of our addictions. Mm -hmm. All the things we think are nice turn out to not be as nice as we thought. So this is another reason why we resist divine truth. Of course, because now it feels like divine truth is taking away all of our pleasures mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, okay, we have this, so we have this problem as it's exposing all of our pain and taking away all of our pleasures. That's what we believe in the moment. It's not true. It's not reality from God's perspective. But this but is, why, is why, we why we resist. We resist. It's a okay. feeling that we have. It's a belief system we have that the majority of people have. And they can't give it up because they don't. The only way to give it up is to experience the pain. Yeah. yeah. And the only way to give it up is to have the light shown on the addictions that turn out to not be as pleasurable as you thought. That's mm -hmm. the only way to give it up. And they don't want to do that. So yeah. they resist the truth. 
Okay, so that's one scale, mm -hmm. the pleasure pain scale. Mm -hmm. What about this other one you mentioned, the truth fear scale? Yeah, so a lot of people um, will only receive truth to the point that their fear is not triggered. So in other words, you know, if the truth is universal or external, they go, okay, yeah, I can accept that. So somebody comes along and says, do you realise that we can put a satellite in the sky, right, and bounce a few signals off of it so that you know where your position is anywhere on the earth within one metre? And you go, wow, that's a great idea. That benefits my life. Um, it reduces my fear. It reduces my fear. So, of course, I'd love to do that. In effect, it has a huge reduction in my fear. So, of course, I'm going to go for that. Yeah. All right. But now if another person come along and said, do you realise that you are full of emotional pain and suffering and you've got all this grief about your childhood that you've got to feel and it's all about how your dad abused you and your mum did this and your dad did that and whatever. Now you're looking at that and you go, I don't see any immediate benefit here <laughs> to addressing this particular problem. Your fear is now through the roof. Yeah. So where is your desire for truth? It's very, very minor and low. We only des usually desire truth to the point where, we're going to th where we believe we're going to benefit from it. Mm -hmm. So the problem is with our beliefs again. Most of the time we believe that if, if we receive God's truth, it's going to result in restriction to our life. It's going to result in more fear. Mm -hmm. right? So a lot of people don't want to discuss things about the spirit world, for example, because they become afraid of where they're going to end up. Right? Yeah. They're still going to end up where they're going to end up in the end. So it doesn't make any sense to avoid it. But, and in fact, if they found out where they're going to end up right now and then they did something about it, they might be able to completely avoid it if they did something about it. But they don't want to because their fear goes through the roof. And when the fear goes through the roof, you then have this desire to suppress the knowledge of truth. And this is one of our problems is that once the fear is that high and we're unwilling to feel the fear, and that's the real problem, the unwillingness to feel the fear itself so we can, by experience, reduce it, we then, our fear then governs how much or what kind of truth we will accept. When the fear about a certain issue is high, we will only accept a very small portion of truth when our fear is going to be reduced by accepting a truth or our fear is, going to be, is, is not going to be affected at all by accepting a truth, then we readily accept it. But that unfortunately means that our fear defines what truth we will accept. Yeah. And all of God's truths are, are, are often exposing our fears. Now we have a lot of trouble because now what we're doing is we go, I don't want any of God's truth because it's going to expose more of my fears. And yet the truth is when we receive God's truth, it does expose our fears, but then we, it, it actually removes them eventually. Well, we, get, we get to feel them and as yeah. we feel them, we remove them. Yeah. That's the beauty of it. The truth is the only thing, in fact, that can reduce fear. That's the sad thing about it. Mm. It's like, how do I... How do I not be afraid of knowing where I am? By having the truth of where I am. That's why a GPS unit is great. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm in a fixed place on the planet, right, and I don't know where I am, and then I've got a little device that tells me within a metre where I am, I now have no fear. I know exactly where I am. Yeah. Knowing the truth actually reduces our fear. Yeah. Right? That's, that's the truth. But unfortunately, we believe opposite to that. We believe that having God's truth exposing us will expose our fears. And because we're unwilling to feel those fears, we unfortunately believe that the problem is with the truth. And so we deny it. We push the truth back away again. We don't want to experience it. Mm. And that's when we start running into trouble with the fear truth scale. All right, what about the third scale, the desire apathy scale that you mentioned? Yeah, well, this is another reason why people don't accept divine truth on the planet is because they don't have a strong desire for it. They're apathetic about it. It's like, uh, do you want to know the secrets of the universe? Not really. I'm having <laughs> enough trouble with my day-to-day -day life, thank you very much, <laughs> type of thing. It's like... Um, so why are we so apathetic towards truth? Well, in the end, we're apathetic mostly because we're suppressing pain. 
you know, one of the reasons, primary reasons of apathy is to try and avoid pain. If, if, we, if we don't have to do anything, then we get to avoid some things. We, we're never going to avoid them in the long run, of course. God's universe is constructed in such a way that truth is unavoidable in the end. But, but we want to avoid it for as long as possible. And one way of avoiding it is by just being apathetic to it, saying, oh, it doesn't, I don't care, it yeah. doesn't worry me. Yeah. When it often does worry us, but we're just not honest. Right? Unfortunately, too, we don't have a desire. We, we, we often taught from a very young age in this world, uh, we're taught to, that we're never going to have anything we want actually come to us. We better get used to it. We better get used to it. And in fact, some parents purposefully teach their children that. Some parents actually try to withhold things from their children on purpose in order to teach the child that they're never always going to get what they want. Mm -hmm. Now, because of that, we, we learn to suppress our desires in order to not feel pain. So whenever you have a desire that isn't met, generally you feel a bit of pain as a result when there's an emotion inside of you about the desire uh, that's out of harmony with love. And as a result, you feel pain. So, so we, we're taught to not desire anything. And we're taught also that some things are pointless to desire. Mm. One of those things that are pointless to desire is the truth about the universe, the truth about spiritual existence, the truth about our emotions. All of those things that are more difficult to understand, we're taught that it's impossible to know. Because we're in taught or told that it's impossible to know before we begin, mm -hmm. we have no desire to know. We think that it's impossible before we begin. And it's like telling a child, I'm never going to give you that thing, so don't even bother trying. Yeah. Now, if the child has that taught often enough and long enough to them, they will never try to get that thing, mm. ever. Mm -hmm. Because they've, they've been taught already to believe that. And this is the problem with our desire. We often are very, very apathetic. And as a result of apathy, we have no desire for universal truth, for God's mm -hmm. truth. Mm -hmm. We have no desire to know what the absolute truth is. In fact, many of us now believe that it's not even possible to know. And as a result, we, have no, we take no action to know. So because of that, we often then suppress desire to know and therefore we live in apathy. Mm -hmm. And that causes us to remain stagnant and therefore in opposition to divine truth, because mm. divine truth is going to encourage change. It's a similar issue though, isn't it? I find in apathy there's usually a lot of anger and underneath that a lot of pain. And so yes. it, yeah. with all three of the scales that you're describing, uh, our desire for truth mm -hmm. versus our fear, yeah. our desire or our desire versus our apathy, yeah. and what was the third one? The um, the pleasure pain, pleasure pain scale, yep. they're all really based around our fear of pain, aren't they? They our, are. Our fear of experiencing pain. And so mm -hmm. this is why we're so resistive to divine truth. It's not just our fear of experiencing pain, physical pain, because most people no. can cope with a degree of physical pain. It's more the emotional pain and emotional suffering mm -hmm. that we are trying to avoid. So if you look at the, uh, you know, the pleasure pain scale, the reason why we're so focused on lives of pleasure without any consideration of whether it's loving or not, without any consideration of truth, is because we are trying to avoid the pain. You know, we're trying to run away from how things emotionally feel to us. Mm -hmm. And it's always in the end the emotional part of our existence that we're avoiding rather than the physical part of the existence. So... While we may be seeking physical pleasure, oftentimes it's to avoid emotional pain. Mm. While we may be seeking to, you know, to avoid truth, oftentimes it's because of the emotional pain we'll feel when we come to acknowledgement of the truth. Mm -hmm. And while we're, and we're often suppressing desire because we don't want to feel the emotional pain of having our desires unfulfilled. Mm. So a lot of it is all about emotional pain and our inability to experience it. So the primary reason really in the end why most people reject divine truth is because that they do not have a desire to experience 
emotional pain. They don't desire to release the emotional pain, the truth of their current existence. And that is the primary reason why they reject the truth. Mm, thank you. Mm. You've said that divine truth has specific qualities and attributes. Mm. Can you firstly list a summary of them and then can we discuss them one by one? Yes, well, let's, uh, let's do that. Let's do that. What I'll do is I'll, I've written them down for you so you can read them out. But before you read them out, I'd like to say a few things about them. Firstly, this list that we're going to read out now about the qualities and attributes of divine truth is not exhaustive. In other words, it's not the only qualities of divine truth, but we're going to list 14 different qualities that, are, that if you use them even individually, you can easily determine whether something is divine truth or not as a result of comparing them with the, each individual quality once you understand the quality and how it works. Secondly, we need to see that divine truth or God's truth has these attributes and qualities and what we mean by attributes and qualities we need to understand. If, if we think about it this way, if I had to describe my hand, we could say that it has certain attributes and qualities. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Mm -hmm. we, we know that it's covered with skin. We know that it has a certain shape. There are five fingers. Each finger has a certain type of construction. The thumb, which is a different type of construction than the other four fingers. We, we, we can see there's nails on the end of each finger. We can see how the fingers can contract. We can see that they don't have the ability to go the opposite direction. These are all qualities and attributes of a hand. Mm -hmm. right? Now, in the same way, God's truth has a definition of all of the attributes and qualities of which we're going to list some. We're not listing them all. It's like I just did not list all of the qualities of my hand. No. Because the qualities of my hand have all sorts of other qualities, including the tendons that link to muscles in my arm and all these other things are all involved with it. We've got how it's constructed with flesh, bone and all these other aspects. But, but they are all qualities of every single person's hand. Mm -hmm. Every single person who's not deformed has a hand like that yeah. with all the same qualities. <laughs> but basically time. you're saying you're describing attributes of your hand, each attribute isn't your hand, but it is something that's common to every hand. Exactly. Yeah. So each attribute is common to this, that we're going to list about the qualities of the divine truth, is common to God's truth uniquely. Yeah. And, and that's different to people's truth generally. And God has many truths, but every one of them has the same attributes. Exactly. Okay. So, so when we ask the truth about God's love, it's going to have all of these attributes. When we ask the truth about faith, it's going to have all these attributes. When we ask the truth about how does gravitation work, it's going to have all of these attributes. Yeah. When we ask the truth about like potential things we haven't discovered yet, teleportation, levitation, uh, interstellar transportation, and so forth, it's going to have attributes that are all matching this these lists of truths. Correct. Does that make sense? Yes. So, so the beauty of God's truth in the understanding these particular attributes or definitions, if you like, of what... So we're not actually saying what God's truth is. No. Because, because we can't say what God's truth is because God's truth is infinite and to say what it is would take me an infinite amount of time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but we can say what attributes it has, what qualities it has, so that we can recognise it when we see it. And that's why it's very important to understand this list. Mm -hmm. so, so what we need to see is that these attributes and qualities are in every one of God's truths. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are more attributes and qualities that are present in every one of God's truths other than these 14. But, but once you understand these 14 basic attributes and qualities, you will have a much easier time in knowing what is God's truth and what is not, just by testing anything against these particular qualities. Mm -hmm. And so if you, if you take that approach, you will find 
that it's quite easy to determine what might be God's truth in comparison to what is just human ideas or concepts. Now, there are many human ideas and concepts that will fit into these principles. Are they God's truth then? They will turn out to be, probably. Yeah. But they haven't proven to be true on a number of levels yet. So, okay. so there are many things that we can come up with as ideas that match these qualities. And ideas that match these qualities often turn out to be truth mm -hmm. of God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So perhaps if what we do is just list them and, okay. uh, and, and then we'll have another series of questions where we discuss them one by one. All right. Mm. Okay. Number one, divine truth is infinite. Number two, divine truth is of itself a thing apart and admits no variations or modifications. Number three, divine truth and love are always in perfect harmony and without truth, love cannot be complete. Number four, divine truth does not and cannot compromise even for the sake of peace. Number five, divine truth itself with all the power and knowledge that it has at its foundation, will not compel a man to accept it against his will. Divine truth honours free will. Number six, divine truth will never and can never accommodate itself to the beliefs of men. Seven, divine truth results in freedom. Eight, divine truth results in a fearless existence. Nine, divine truth does not hurt anyone or anything. Ten, divine truth does not allow the lie no matter what the price. Eleven, Living out of harmony with divine truth results in penalties or consequences. Twelve, divine truth is demonstrated by actions, supported by evidence that is scientific, emotional, physical and spiritual. Thirteen, divine truth is felt. It is emotional. Fourteen, Personal truth must be faced before divine truth can be found. So perhaps if what we do is, I'll just clarify the 14th point, personal truth must be faced. What I'm saying there basically is that there's this aspect of divine truth that exposes your personal condition as it really is, not as you want to believe it is. Mm -hmm. So that's the, aspect, that's the aspect of number 14. It always exposes the error within the individual. But if you, if you examine that list, you can see that it's quite a comprehensive list. And divine truth has, the, has every one of those qualities as a part of itself all the time. So if any one of these qualities are missing, then there's a high likelihood it's not completely divine truth at that point. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if I can give an example of that, there's, an, there's a part of divine truth that talks about honouring free will, and then there's a part that says it won't compromise. That doesn't mean you'd go to war because going to war would not honour another person's free will. Mm. So, so, so the two are harmonious. The two are going to be harmonious with each other. So the thing we need to understand with these qualities is that they are all harmonious with each other. That is an indication that they are divine truth. Yeah. So all of these qualities are harmonious with each other. They are all qualities or attributes that define what truth is from God's perspective. And because we now have these qualities that we can list one at a time, which we'll go through in, the, in this next discussion we have about this subject, once we list them one at a time, the, the listeners will see that every single quality has this unique ability for or a unique way in which it exposes error and we can give some examples of that as well 
So what we're going to do now is we're going to, with these qualities, is we're going to ask two questions. Mm -hmm. The first question we're going to ask is, what is the quality itself? So with regard to point number one that you raised, God's truth is infinite. What does that mean? Yeah. God's truth is infinite. What does it mean? The second part that we're going to ask to, uh, to that question is, how would that look like if I felt that and believed that in my own life? What would it, what, what, what effect, would day-to-day -day life what look What would day-to-day like? -day life look like yep. if I actually had that belief or that understanding in my soul? So that are the two questions that we're going to ask the next time we get together on this subject. Great, great. So thanks for your time today, guys, and uh, we'll look forward to discussing this subject further with you. As I've said, we've had, we will have many, many more uh, questions to ask about divine truth, but the next couple of sessions will be primarily about discussing these 14 issues of divine truth in two different ways. And so basically, the next two sessions will contain 14 questions each. And, uh, and then we'll get on to other subjects related to divine truth after that. Yeah. So thanks for your time.